Hello, fifth graders. Welcome to science. We are going to continue our study of ecosystems. I'm going to share my screen and start a presentation with you. All right. So today we're going to talk about the energy that moves through ecosystems. Big idea, living things interact in an ecosystem and energy flows from the sun to the plants and the animals. So we're talking a lot about food chains today. So from producers to consumers, that food chain never stops. So in the tundra, here's just an example of a food chain. Tundra is the coldest, driest ecosystem. It has short summers. There's not a lot of plant growth there. And many of the animals either will migrate or hibernate during the cold winters. But the reindeer moss uses energy derived from the sun to make sugar. And that is a producer, and it forms the base of the food chain in the tundra. Remember, every food chain begins with a producer, a plant type of organism. Then the caribou are the first consumers. They are herbivores and they eat the reindeer moss and then and other producers to get their energy and then the wolves are the second level consumers they are predators and they eat the animals like the caribou which are their prey here is another example scavengers like the arctic gull they feed on the dead bodies of caribou wolves and other animals Fungi and bacteria do that final cleanup in that um, food chain from the tundra with the um, reindeer moss to the caribou to the wolves and then in comes the gulls and the fungi and bacteria to decompose, decompose that final remains of a tundra organism. So the transfer of food energy from one organism to the next in an ecological community is called a food chain. Um, as I said, every food chain begins when a producer gets energy from the sun. Then the producer um, gets that energy from the sun, it creates chemical energy into sugars that is used for food. Now, food not used for this life process is stored in the tissues of the producer, and then it is consumed by herbivores that eat the producers for energy. Herbivores are considered first level consumers. Next in the food chain are carnivores and omnivores, the second level consumers. Second level consumers eat the herbivores and they receive the food energy stored in those bodies. Then you have third level consumers they eat second level consumers. <laughs> so the scavengers may be, can be in the second or third level consumer because they're going to eat any organism that's died. Decomposers are that final step in that food chain. So they get energy as they break down the remains of the dead plants and animals and return the nutrients to the soil. So food webs are very much like a spider web. It's held together with a lot of different connecting threads. Um, you know, it's not just a chain, one to the next, to the next, to the next, but it can spread out. And that's why it's considered a web. Um, here, it talks about a food web because we don't just eat one type of food and a lot of um, predators, uh, a lot of um, carnivores and omnivores don't eat just one type of food. So the food web shows how they overlap. So um, if on the next slide, we're going to look at a forest food web. And you can see that the mouse and the insects both eat parts of the same tree. And a snake can eat a mouse, a salamander, salamander or a kinglet. And all these living th things eventually become food for decomposers. Um, there are arrows that are gonna be around the web and they're gonna point in the direction that the energy moves. 
um, we're going to look for the acorn and the mouse and um, see which way it goes from the acorn to the mouse. Um, energy, of course, is derived from the sun used by the producer to create his own food, right? The tree creates his own food and his energy is transferred through the food web to consumers and decomposers. Uh, just as in food chains, decomposers are the final link in a food web. Uh, common decomposers are fungi and bacteria. They get their energy just from breaking down the remains of dead animals. Predators limit the number of animals in a food web. If snakes are removed from a forest food web, the number of mice would increase. More mice mean that more plants would be eaten. Eventually, the mice might run out of food and begin to die off and that would affect all the living things that eat mice. So you can see that all of the organisms in a food web are what we call interdependent. They need one another. So here is that picture that we were talking about before. And so we are finding um, over here the, the mouse and the acorn and seeing uh, how these all interconnect and they, they don't just go in a straight line, they connect out in different ways. And so um, you can see why they call it a food web. So in this food web, the arrows are the path of energy from one organism to the next. So the arrows from the mouse to the red-tailed hawk. Um, that means that the hawk eats the mouse. Fungi get their nutrients from decomposers, meaning that something has to die for the fungi to get its nutrients. So what do you think would happen to the hawk population if the number of mice decreased? Hmm. They would either leave that habitat or they might start dying off because they don't have food. So um, it takes a lot of grass to support a hawk at the top of the food chain. Although hawks don't eat grass, the energy they use comes from the grass at the bottom. Because remember, everything starts with a producer and grass is a producer. So even though the hawk is at that top part of that food chain or food web, the grass is still just as important because the hawk is going to need that grass even though he doesn't eat it because the animals he does eat, eat that grass. So we're gonna talk for a minute about what's called an energy pyramid. Um, it shows how much energy passes from one organism to another up a food chain. And the organisms in a layer of the pyramid eat those in a lower layer because it takes many producers to support a number of consumers. Producers who get their energy for the sun are the most numerous group. Um, here you've got some krill and clams and herring. They are first level consumers. They consume phytoplankton from the first level. Some first level consumers eat millions of tiny phytoplankton. Phytoplankton would be at the base of a pyramid. Third level consumers are like a leopard seal or they are a predator that's at the top of an energy pyramid because they have the least amount of energy available to them. And so that's why their population is small. Second level consumers like an octopus and salmon, they feed on the first levels. So you can see on this, um, we've got the very bottom, the, the phytoplankton, and then you have the krill and the clams. Second level, you have octopus and salmon that are feeding on the krill and the clams and the herring. And then at the top, you have um, the leopard seal because he, he only can eat the things that are just there below him. So here is kind of an energy pyramid that you can see. Um, so the, if the environment changes, that can affect the flow of an energy pyramid. So, Let's say that salmon is reduced because of overfishing. Well then, since the seals eat the salmon, they may go hungry, they may even starve. 
uh, if they don't have salmon to eat, and if the salmon aren't there, then the krill population is going to increase rapidly because they're not being eaten by the salmon. And a large number of krill could then eat up its own food source as well as that is other species. And so one chain in the, one change in the flow of energy in an ecosystem affects all the other species in that ecosystem. And it doesn't matter what level it's at. Any change in there can affect the whole rest of the pyramid. So here on this diagram, at each level of this pyramid, 90% of the energy received from the lower level is used for life processes. Only 10% gets passed upward each time. So today, you have an assignment in Google Classroom and it is a, a energy pyramid and you have to um, put the right things in the right levels of the energy pyramid. So please use your book or come back and use these slides and pause and, and find what you need. You can always reach out to me if you need help and um, I can help you with that. Have a great day.